Okay, good evening, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Bettina Haseler. I'm a PhD student at the University of Hohenheim in Stuttgart. And as you already said, the title of my talk is Laser Induced Sample Alterations During, during Raman Measurements of Mass Relevant Biomolecules. And I have to say, I have a cooperation with the Institute of Planetary Research uh, at the DLR in Berlin. And this is also where I perform, performed the Raman measurements. So, this is the content of my talk. First of all, I will, yeah, first I will talk about Raman spectroscopy and, uh, yeah, the method itself and its application areas. Um, I will talk a little bit about the scientific assumptions we made for the experiments that we performed and also the problems that might come up. Um, then I will, sh yeah, I will show you our experimental setup with some photos and also talk a little bit about the sample preparation. Then uh, you will see some results and uh, I will yeah, talk a little bit about the conclusions we made and also the future work. So Raman spectroscopy is a method for analyzing minerals and also organic materials and mixtures of both. Um, it's generally known as a non-destructive method and um, there is, yeah, normally there's no sample preparation needed and it's very easy to apply. There are many application fields for Raman spectroscopy, technical areas, for example, material research, then in geology, as we already heard today, and astrobiology, of course, also, and there, um, especially when, uh, yeah, one is looking for the oldest traces of life on Earth, um, if extremophil extremophiles are investigated and also their habitats, and uh, also meteorites have been investigated by Raman spectroscopy. And there are, of course, many, many other fields of application. In the future, mass, um, yeah, Raman spectroscopy will be applied on Mars. Um, we heard of the ExoMars mission today, and uh, yeah, it will also be maybe it will also be applied when missions come, yeah, go to other planets or to other bodies in the solar system. And um, yeah, on the right here, uh, this is a picture of the ExoMars rover. And um, the ExoMars rover has this Pasteur Analytical Laboratory and the RLS, which is short for Raman Laser Spectrometer, is part of this Pasteur Analytical Laboratory. And yeah, there are some parameters down here. First of all, we have the excitation wavelength of 532 nanometers. The RLS will have an irradiance of 0.2 to 0.25 kilowatts per square centimeters. The spot size will be around 50 microns, and uh, we have a spectral range between 150 and 3,800 wave numbers, and a spectral resolution of six wave numbers. Um, yeah, for our experiment, we did some assumptions. First of all, we think about Mars, early Mars, to that it was warm and wet. So there would be the possibility that life evolved on Mars in a comparable way it did on Earth. And then probably we might find some biosignatures on Mars. Um, yeah, one biosignature, one biosignature would be uh, whole organisms, but um, this is rather unlikely when we look on the upper surface on Mars. Um, but there might be chemical components of cells or cell compartments, for example, lipids, proteins, or pigments, sunscreen pigments. And we might also find alteration products of these biomolecules or these chemical components. Um, we think about Raman spectroscopy to be a good method, a suitable method to detect biosignatures on Mars. And that's why we designed an experiment um, to measure biomolecules under Mars-like conditions. Um, 
when we use when we think about Raman spectroscopy on Mars, there might be some problems. First of all, we have the problem that biomolecules um, might also be of abiotic origin. So we might get false positive results. Um, the second thing is that um, this bios uh, the biosignatures, if they are true, biosignatures might be destructed during the measurement with Raman spectroscopy, this is because we, uh, we saw that uh, when in, in former measurements we performed, we saw that biomolecules get destroyed by the Raman laser when we go high enough with the intensity. And that would give us also false negatives. <coughs> um, yeah, because this products, this alteration products that, uh, that we might get out of this process, when, when the laser dis destroys the sample, they are also probably of, uh, yeah, they, they might be of abi mm, yeah, abiotic origin also. A, a third problem is that we, um, we will not find, probably we will not find high concentrations of biomolecules or something like that on Mars. So we probably will have the problem that we will not detect the, bio, the biosignature or uh, we will have interfering effect from the matrix it is yeah, it's surrounded. And that would give us also a false negative result. So here are some pictures of the experimental setup. Um, here you see the Raman microscope. This is part of the Raman facility at the DLR in Berlin. And underneath that microscope you see the cryo a cryostat. We use that cryostat as a Martian simulation chamber. Um, we were able to cool the sample in the cryostat and we also could evacuate it. And uh, we could create a stable vacuum within the cryostat. Um, as cooling agent, we used helium. You see the helium can here. And we were able to cool our samples to define temperatures by this uh, intelligent temperature controlling device. And uh, here you can have a look into, inside uh, of the cryostat. You see that many parts in here ha are made of copper. This is because copper has a very good thermal conductivity. And we can be sure then that our samples, which you see here in these holes in the sample carrier, are really at the temperature we want it to be. Yeah, what we wanted to do with this experiment was that we want to, um, we want to measure biomolecules surely under Martian conditions. And as we know that biomolecules can be sensitive to, to, the, to the laser, when we measure with high laser intensity, we wanted to see if there are differences if we use different types of, um, of samples. So we used powdered and pelleted samples. And we also wanted to know if the temperature that is around the sample, or the temperature the sample has, also has an influence on, this, um, on the sensitivity of the biomolecule. So this was our intention. Uh, here you see the biomolecules we actually used for this experiment. On the upper left, this is um, a porphyrin. It's heming chloride. <coughs> Sorry. It's an iron porphyrin complex with chloride as ligand. And um, this, is, um, this, this molecule plays, uh, an, yeah, it plays an important role in many gas transport or electron transport processes in many organisms. And uh, you see here the Raman, re the Raman reference spectra of this biomolecule. It's taken from this pellet sample. And these pelleted samples are um, made of a, a sodium chloride pellet. We produced a pellet of sodium chloride. And the biomolecule powders were applied on top of that pellet and were pre pressed. So it's quite compact. <coughs> on this uh, picture, on this side, you see the cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is um, 
electron transfer protein. And uh, this is actually very, I guess it's a very good um, biomolecule for this experiment because it is uh, evolutionary, very old. We find it also in very, in all organisms we find it, in all organisms we know. And that's, that's, that makes it very interesting for us and if we, we look on Mars. Um, yeah, you see a picture of the pellet and also the reference spectra taken from this pellet. <coughs> Here on the bottom left we have the beta carotene. This is a pigment. It's very common in many organisms. And uh, this is also a very interesting biomolecule because it gives very intensive Raman bands because of a, a resonance Raman effect. And we also can see it if, with it, if it is mixed into um, minerals, into a matrix. Then we still will see this biomolecule this make, that makes it very, a very good candidate. And on, here you see um, the last biomolecule we use. This is a phospholipid. This is short for a very long name. And um, this phospholipid, uh, we choose this because this is very common in bacterial membranes. So, yeah. Here are the measuring parameters we used for our experiment. We also used this 532 nanometers excitation wavelengths. Um, yeah, we measured at different times depending on what biomolecule we were measuring. And uh, we had a grating of 600 lines per millimeter. Spot size was actually very small. It's around 1.3 um, micrometers and uh, pressure was very low. And um, this is because as we could not create, we were not able to, to create a really Martian atmosphere. So we, um, we wanted to get rid at least of all the oxygen or almost all oxygen to avoid burning processes or oxidation. Yeah, then we had some parameters that were, were variable. So we used two sample types, powders and pellets. We measured them at different temperatures from yeah, room temperature, it's plus 25 or 298 Kelvin, down to minus 73 degrees Celsius or 200 Kelvin. And um, so we measured these dif different sample types uh, having this different temperatures with increasing laser power to see at what laser power level this biomolecules really get destroyed or how sensitive they are. And if the temperature, as a, first of all we wanted to know what's the influence of the sample type when we use a powder or a more compact sample like this pellets. And then we also wanted to see is there a, an influence of the, of the temperature. So this is one result. This is a, here we compare hemin. I, I, sh I just show you hemin today because, yeah, it's, we, I don't have uh, much time. So we just stay with hemin. And here we see the hemin powders. This is the, um, the Raman spectra of hemin powders measured from 0.2 milliwatts up to 7 milliwatts. And uh, on the right we see the hemin pellet our pellet pressed on that sodium chloride pellet, also measured from here 0.3 up to uh, 2.5 milliwatts. And what you can see here, when we measure powder, we have a change in the spectra um, at 0.4 milliwatts. And when we measure powders, this is um, it's not constant, this value. So sometimes we also find destruction of the, of the sample at even lower laser powers or sometimes at higher. So it's not predictable when this biomolecule gets destroyed when we measure a powdered sample. But when we measure a pellet, um, this, this sign, this first sign, this is this lift here. As you see here, it's, it's lifted up the spectra. Um, appears when we measure pellet at one milliwatts. So, and this is uh, quite constant for pellets and for hemine. Um, yeah, even, even when we repeated this measurement, we, all, we always got um, this first sign of destruction at one milliwatt. 
And now we also wanted to, to know if the temperature has an influence. So we measured this hemin pelleted sample at here 298K and at 200K. And when you, you will have a look on the right, we also find this um, first sign of destruction here at one milliwatt. And um, when we go, yeah, when you have a look on the right now, we are at 200 K, K, Kelvin. Um, there is just a slight change in that. So at, at this, in this case, we have uh, the destruction or the start of the destruction at, at 1.5 milliwatts. And uh, this is not a really big difference. So we cannot really say that, that this is, uh, that temperature, this temperature really has an effect. But maybe if we go lower th with the temperature, maybe then it will be, yeah, it will be more, um, the, the effect will be bigger. So this is maybe something we can do in the future. Yeah, just um, what I can say now uh, is that when we measure powdered samples, uh, the laser power range where the sample is destroyed is very broad. So it's not very predictable to, to yeah, it's not predictable to say um, when the biomolecule gets destroyed at what laser power. But when we use a pellet, um, this range is actually m smaller and uh, the sample also can be measured with higher laser intensity. Uh, this might be and it, yeah, this might be better when we go on Mars to, to know um, that pellet samples might be the better sample type in this case. Um, but using sample is not strictly necessary, uh, but it might, be, yeah, it might uh, simplify the measuring process and uh, it also improves the reproducibility. So this is yeah, pretty good. And the, the second thing is the ambient temperature, which has actually no effect when we measure powder samples. We don't see an effect there. Um, and when we measure pellets, there is hardly, uh, it, there is a small effect, but it's um, hardly significant. So we, um, yeah, we might do more measurements in this direction. So in the future, <coughs> we, should measure more biomolecules and maybe whole organisms. Um, we also should mix them, of course, with um, metrics, with mass-relevant mineral matrices like uh, clay minerals. And uh, then we will also see, um, yeah, then we have to, pre we have to um, prepare different concentrations of biomolecule and metrics to see uh, what detection limit Raman spectroscopy actually has, and this will also be very important when we measure ma with Raman on Mars. So all these experiments together might help to optimize the Raman measuring pro measuring protocol, and helps to gain out the best possible results of this method. Thank you very much for your interest.